Good afternoon. I'm Professor Barbara Purifoy Selden. November is an election time. And the time is there to determine the composition of Congress. It is our duty to know the most critical issues facing the United States. Our meeting today is to have a discussion with Dr. Vinip Nana Asante Kankam de Costa about United States political, economic, and social issues based on his book, Who is Fit to Rule America in the 21st Century and Beyond? Hello, my name is William Nagy, Jr. I have earned a Master of Arts degree in education. I am a physical education and health instructor at a strict discipline academy in Detroit, Michigan. Dr. Nana, as voters, we want to be well informed. So what is the most pressing economic problem facing the United States of America today? The most pressing economic problem we face in the United States today that can linger on to the future is the huge national debt. The United States, the wealthiest nation in the world, has the largest debt in the history of a superpower. In 2014, it is estimated that the debt is around $17 trillion. If this trend continues over a long period of time, American future will be disastrous because the debt rate increases in the geometrical number patterns like 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024. But the revenue base of the government that creates surplus to pay the debt increases in arithmetical number patterns, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So by the time the revenue base reaches 10, the debt increases up to 1,024. So if you increase it by 1 to 11, it also doubles. Therefore, the earlier we find a concrete solution to solve this problem, the better it will be for every American in the future. Huge national debt is really a disaster to America, and people don't even know. It's not going to be pretty in the future if American government is broke and is financially impotent. Assuming there is a hurricane, like Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, that type of destruction, if it happens, where are we going to get help if not the federal government? Assuming there is a heavy snow pour that has created potholes all over the metro freeways in America, who has to face them if not the United States government? Thank you. And Large national debt is an economic cancer that can permeate into all aspects of life. It can ruin the social structure foundation of the society. It can destroy the unique institutions, traditions, and establishment. It can make life uncertain and ultimately hopeless. At times, it can create dialectical opinions over simple issues that can lead to one-term destruction of human life. In critical times, critical decisions are made, and some of the decisions are very hasty. And as a result, with a hasty decision, imagine we wake up today, and the government says it can no longer continue the Social Security and you take your money and put it in a private investment, and the company breaks, or breaks down, you have lost your entire life savings. So, in view of this, if the government today says that it can no longer continue Medicaid, what will our seniors do? We shall see the misery 
of old age and the measure of disability. And as a result, we have to look at this financial debt has to be taken care of. It's assuming that the federal government is declared bankrupt, like the way Detroit has been declared bankrupt, and people are demonstrating over pension. And guess what? They are demonstrating over common water of unpaid bills. And you just imagine living in a civilized world and your water has been shut down for 10 to 29 days. How will you smell? These are some of the issues in which huge national debt can create. Because in critical times, critical decisions are always made. Dr. Nana, my name is Yolanda. I want to know what is the history behind the United States debt creation? Because it used to be a debt-free nation. Who and what has contributed to this astronomical debt? The debt creation in America, according to your question, who and what? First of all, the debt has been created by wars that are not supported by the taxpayers' money. Two, it has also been caused by governmental policies that are geared towards sectional interests. And your question is, America has been a debt-free nation. America has not been a debt-free nation throughout history. We have a period in which debt was created with payment plan. And then at a time in which debt was created without payment plan. And I will explain that. Taking it from Kimberly Amelio's article, the Revolutionary War created $21.5 million. By 1791, the debt increased to $75 million. And the War of 1812 also increased it further. But the leaders tried as much as possible to, to, to pay the debt. So by 1835, American debt was completely paid off. The reckless policy of Andrew Jackson, the first Democratic president of America, refused to reestablish the National Bank of America. When it happened, he took the entire federal money from the bank and put it in state banks because he believed in state rights. Then also, he asked every American to pay land with gold. That created economic panic, and it led to economic depression. So by 1860, our debt has increased again to $65 million. At the same time, the Civil War occurred. And with the Civil War, the debt increased to $2.7 billion. But a tent was made to pay. So by the Gilded Age of 1890, the debt was reduced to $1.5 million. By the end of the century, the debt went up to $2 billion. Then President Teddy Roosevelt, the last progressive leader of the Republican Party, and President Taft, the first ultra-conservative leader of the Republican Party, increased the debt to $3 billion, which was handed over to Woodrow Wilson, the first progressive leader of the Democratic Party. Woodrow Wilson would have been able to pay off the debt, but unfortunately, at that time, the First World War okay. With the First World War, the debt increased to $27 billion. But when peace was restored, he set up a good economic environment and he was able to reduce the debt to $24 billion. After him, because the economy was good, President Harding reduced it 
President Coolidge reduced it. By the time of President Hoover, the debt have come down to $16 billion. But then, in the 1920s, often known as the Roaring Twenties, the economy was good. But the Republicans' hands-off approach, government do nothing, do little, did not regulate anything, allow business to do whatever they want, to grab profit. As a result, it led to the Great Depression. With the Great Depression, the debt increased to $72 billion. So while Roosevelt was dealing with the Depression, the Second World War also occurred. And with the Second World War, the debt increased to $259 billion. Thereafter him, President Truman added a little Arsenal added a little, and Kennedy and Johnson also added a little. The next stage of our debt that went up too high was called by President Nixon. President Nixon's reckless foreign policy in the Middle East led to the oil cartel company to restrict oil production. And as a result, there was oil shortage in America and around the globe, which led to great inflation. With inflation before Clinton, um, Nixon was getting out of office, the debt has increased to $444 billion. And then with President Ford, who came out with a program, whip inflation, but he couldn't whip inflation. By the time he left office, the debt has increased to $699 billion. Then came President Carter. President Carter's time, the Federal Reserve Bank thought that the inflation was caused by monetary inflation. So as a result of that, the, Fe the Federal increased the interest rate to about 20%. And by the time of Carter's rule, the debt had increased to $998 billion. Here then after came President Reagan, the most promising Republican leader. President Reagan, the most charismatic leader, hopeful for every American that the problem will be solved. Therefore, Reagan, who was more charismatic, taking three Republican leaders is counted as one of them. If you take five presidents of America, he is considered as one of them. So there was hope in Reagan. But guess what? His Reaganomics task card policy led an unprecedented debt of $2.8 trillion. So Reagan alone added $1.8 trillion to the existing debt. Then came President George H.W. Bush. He also followed his predecessor. And as a result, the debt increased to $444 billion, a trillion dollars, $4.4 trillion. Here comes President Clinton. We all have hope in President Clinton, but he also added $1.39 trillion to the debt. So the debt he left was $5.8 trillion. Then came President George W. Bush, the Texas governor, more hopeful, enthusiastic, conservative par excellence ready to help America. He was to correct every mistake of the father and of Reagan to move America forward. But unfortunately, he moved Reaganomics tax policy to the Zenith. And as a result, he moved America into two front wars. This situation 
led also an unprecedented debt of $11.6 trillion. This is the debt that Obama inherited. Obama inherited $11.6 trillion. In addition to that, he inherited two front wars. In addition to that, he inherited the power of the economy. In addition to that, he also inherited a critical situation in which he has to do with all this situation. So our debt has been created by wars and government policies that are geared towards sectional interest. Now let's look at this table. Table one on debt creation. If we look at 100 years between 1909 to 2009, we will exclude Obama's one because he's still in office. So between 1909 to 2009, of the debt of $11.6 trillion, the Republicans have created 464% of the debt. And the Democrats have created 1,874% of the debt. So in this way, who is for big government? And who is a big spender? From percentage-wise, we will say that Democrats are for big government. And are big spenders. Then let us look at the real numbers. If we look at the real numbers, for a hundred years, Republicans have created $9.4 trillion, and the Democrats have created $2 trillion. So looking at it from real money terms, who is for the big government? And who is the big spender? So these numbers are there not as a way of campaigning for any political party, but it is showing up for people to pick it up and see how best we can solve this debt creation. I'm solving this debt creation to you because it is like Woodrow Wilson, who stressed to every American that if we were not going to be part of the League of Nations, we should prepare our children for a near future war. People thought his ideas were remote. But he knew that the Versailles Treaty could be misused by European power. So if America were not to be part of the League of Nations, it was going to be disastrous. And people didn't take him serious. So when Hitler came, he promised the Germans to take them back to 1871 greatness. With the 1871 greatness, he came out with strategies. Nobody questioned his strategies, and his strategies made war inevitable. And the war did come. So Wilson's drum beat came true. That's why I'm also emphasizing to you about this huge national debt that has been created over a long period of time. Assuming the, there are examples of national debt that created troubles in the future. The French Revolution was caused by an unsuccessful attempt to pay a huge national debt. The king commissioned the Minister of Finance to find ways and means to solve this problem. The minister attempted everything in the book, but wasn't successful. In the long run, he called upon the State General to solve the problem. The State General had not met for 300 years at the meeting, the first and the second estates, who were the nobles and the wealthiest people in the society refused to reason with the government as well as the third estate. 
on how to levy reasonable taxes to pay the huge debt. But the third estate also saw that their own people pay taxes. But at that critical time, people were having it difficult in getting ordinary bread. In view of this, the third estate revolted and led to the Great Revolution in France. But what happened in this revolution? Many important personalities were guillotined. And France went into an era of terror. Out of this came Napoleon Bonaparte, the child of the revolution. And by the time Napoleon got out from office, France lost Haiti and eventually lost their possession in North America, the entire Mississippi Basin that we always refer to as Louisiana Pages. Napoleon sold a land of 826,000 square miles for only $15 million. Another nation that faced critical economic problem or financial crisis was Great Britain after the French and Indian War. Great Britain was broke. They want to find ways and means to pay their debt. Then what happened? They targeted Americans to be the source of getting the money to pay the debt. And when they did, American ordinary folks saw that they had to pay the debt of Britain. So they supported their leaders and revolted against Britain which led to the American Revolution. Therefore, Britain lost the entire 13 states of America. And that's why this debt creation is becoming astronomical, and it has to be taken care of. Dr. Villette Nana, is there any leader or group that had reduced the US national debt by creating a budget surplus? Talking about by the surplus, which is debt reduction, we're going to take it also from a hundred year period, the way the debt has been calculated on a hundred year period. Now, on the surplus side, President Woodrow Wilson created three billion dollar surplus. President Harden created two billion surplus. President Coolidge created six billion surplus. And President Cuba also created one billion surplus. Then President Truman created 19 billion surplus. And President Arsenal created two billion surplus. After that, is there anyone that care about reducing the debt? Nobody, until President Clinton. Clinton <coughs> increased the tax rate. And Newey Gingrich was also in Congress reducing expenditure. So that was, that was bipartisan approach to solve the problem. So they were able to balance the budget. In 1998, there was $69 billion surplus. In 1999, there was $123 billion surplus. And the year 2000, there was $230 billion. So in all, they were able to create $432 billion. That was unprecedented in American history. But then, after that, nobody had ever, or nobody had a reduction plan, or nobody had a plan in paying the debt that we are creating. So looking at it from a hundred years period, the Republicans have created $13 billion surplus, and the Democrats have also created $456 billion surplus. 
And now let's see. Is there any fiscal responsibility in Washington? Is there any accounting system in Washington? If this is the deal, increase in surplus, how can you pay the debt we have created? Now the debt is about $17 trillion. Assuming we want Republicans to pay our debt, so there will be no debt creation. We set everything to zero. And every hundred years, let them create the $13 billion. That's how much they can create. Set everything to zero. And how, how long will it take them to pay our debt? That would take 140,000 years to pay the present debt. Assuming the Democrats also can be considered to pay the debt, how long will it take them to pay the debt? If every hundred years they can create $456 billion, that will also take them 4,000 years before they can pay the debt. But brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ has come 2,000 years ago. And within that 2,000 years ago, so many things have happened. So are we going to sit down and wait for 4,000 years for our debt to be paid? That is very serious. Even if we add Republicans surplus to the Democrats surplus, it, it will still take 4,000 years to pay the debt. But somebody will say, why not we go the continuous way? But we have to know, despite Clinton's surplus, he also left a debt of $1.39 trillion. How did it happen? Even though he created a surplus, there was too much money flowing into the Social Security Fund. So the government has the ability to borrow from itself and spend it. That is what we call the intra-governmental holdings. And so during his time, the surplus went to pay the public debt. But the intra-governmental holdings went up, so higher than the debt creation. And so if we want the Democrats to pay the debt, we have to set intra-governmental holdings to zero. And we have to go by Clinton's plan. We set intra-governmental holdings to zero, and everything to zero. So there will be no debt creation. Then with the Clinton's plans, all things being equal, it will still take 40 to 50 years to pay the debt, which means we are going to starve ourselves to pay the debt. And that is the situation we are facing. And so can we authentically say that, looking at these numbers, can we ask, is there any physical responsibility in Washington, or any accounting system in Washington. This is serious. And this is what we are living for our future generation to come and pay. It's going to be critical. OK. So we take it. Thank you, Dr. Nana, for your very insightful and educative um, analysis of the growth of American debt over the last 100 years. Um, most of the analysis centered on the negative aspect of debt. And there's a school of thought out there that is, debt is not all bad. There are good debt. So in your analysis, do we have any part, is any part of our debt good? Or was there a regime that actually created debt that was for the good of the nation? Thank you. Yes. Always, <coughs> when the economy goes into depression, we expect the government to take us out of the depression. Sometimes a serious recession, we expect the government to take us out of the recession. One good example was the Great Depression. Lord King advised President Roosevelt to 
deficit finance, and it was good. It took us away from the depression, from 25% unemployment rate by 1944. Unemployment rate has come down to 1.2. By 1945, it was 1.19. So, in that way, deficit financing can take us out of depression. In 2008, also looking at the depression, that, uh, the, the recession that we entered, there was the need to deficit finance so that it would take us out of the recession. However, if we create debt, we must have a repayment plan. And that's what I'm talking about. A repayment plan, a plan to pay the debt. When you look at the old debt, that from the Revolutionary War to War of 1812, there was a plan. So by 1835, our debt was wiped out. But then also, the subsequent debt there were attempts to pay the debt until 1912. So, if we are in a Great Depression, if we are in a Great Recession, like the Depression of the 1930s and the Great Recession of 2008, there is a need for deficit funds. So that way, it's a legitimate way to uh, bring the economy up. But what I'm trying to say is, Whenever debt we create, we must have a plan to pay the debt. Other than that, we are putting American future in a disastrous way. I'm Professor Barbara Purifoy Selden. Dr. Nana, your research has revealed that Republican leaders have contributed enormously to this existing debt. So how can Republican leaders solve this problem if given the chance to govern? That is a good question. To pay the debt, first of all, we have to balance budget. The Republicans have one of the solutions in solving the problem, and that is expenditure reduction. They want to cut up or cut off all social programs, or cut some of the social programs, so that people will get to work and increase income, and the government can get revenue from them. Also, when they cut down the social programs, which are not significantly for Americans' development, then that will also go and reduce the debt. However, if they want to cut down the social programs, are they willing to cut down the military expenditure for offensiveness? Offensive military expenditure is what gets us into more trouble. So if they cut down the social programs, social programs are sometimes good. Because if you give the money to people who don't have, they will use the money to buy things in the store, empty the stores. Business will produce to fill the stores. So it generates economic activity. However, if you give money for offensive purpose, that one, the rate of return on investment is always zero or negative. So the Republicans have approached to pay the debt through expenditure reduction. They also have a plan of raising revenue, and that is the tax cut policy. Tax cut is not a bad policy. It's an expansionary policy. And as an expansionary policy, the rationale behind is to expand the economy. But the recipient of the tax cut money also has a different rationale. That is, if they receive the money, and assuming a bank somewhere in another country is offering 20% rate of return on investment, and if they produce in America, 
to hire people to work, and the rate of return on investment is 2%. Where do you think they're going to invest the money? They will invest it where they will get higher rate of return on investment. So they are also rational. And so if you cut down taxes, the recipient you have to regulate so that the tax cut money will be used for the purpose of which it, it is meant for. In that way, Republicans can do a good job. But the tax cut policy has been applied since the Great Depression. It has never resulted in anything good. It rather leads to death. Like I said earlier on, when you look at the tax cut by Hoover, it could not solve the Great Depression problem. When you look at tax cut by Reagan, it increased the debt astronomically to $2.8 trillion. When you examine George H.W. Bush tax cut, it increased the debt also to $4.4 trillion. And then when you look at the uh, second Bush, the Sam Bush, oh my God, he was so impressive. But look at what happened when he cut down taxes for the rich. Tax cut is not a bad policy, but when he did, he left behind almost $6 trillion debt. So they have to re-examine the tax cut policy and see how if it will work by the rationale upon which tax cut is meant for. I have a question. Felix Selden, Dr. Asante, is there any way that Democrats, when given more time, can reduce, if not completely eliminate, the national debt? Excellent. To eliminate the national debt by the Democrats, which means if they are given a long period of time. Long period of time, yes, if Americans discover a problem which is a danger to the society's existence, they always find out which group has solutions to the problem. It has happened in history, like in the early beginning. Americans were looking for what type of government would suit America. And they think democracy is the type of government that will suit America. Should it be one party states or two party states? George Washington himself never believed in two-party system. To him, America should go with one-party state. To Thomas Jefferson, democracy can be a type of government for America if we adopt two-party state system. As a result, America saw that the Democratic Republican Party has a solution in establishing two-party system in America. So they voted for Democratic Republican Party for 28 years, from 1800 to 1828, until Andrew Jackson broke away and formed the Democratic Party and won election in 1828. So for 28 years, Americans voted for one party, which led to establishing two-party system in America. In the 1860s, American industrialization was impeded by the existence of slavery that tied labor to the land. And as a result, the, Demo uh, the Republican Party, who had majority of the progressives, the American people saw that they can really solve the problem of moving America forward in its industrial program. And therefore, they voted for Republican Party to rule for 44 years out of the 52 years, from 1860 to 1912, for 52 years. Republicans ruled 44 out of the 52 years. And by 1920, America became an industrial power. 
Also in 1930s, the Great Depression, the Republican approach was inefficient to solve the problem. Americans saw that the Democrats would rest of it as a progressive leader who solved the problem. Americans voted for the Democratic Party for 20 years, from 1932 to 1952. And by that time, the Depression was completely eliminated. The unemployment rate of 25% in 1930 went down to 1.2 in 1944. So if Americans discover a group that has a solution to solve the problem, they will really vote for that party for a long time to pay off the debt. Then you said, will the Democrats be able to eliminate the debt? Yes, they also have one part of the solution, and that is raising revenue. They know how to raise revenue, and to raise revenue is to increase tax. That is something a lot of Americans don't want to hear. But if you increase tax, you increase the revenue base of the government. So if they increase tax, they have to also reduce expenditure. So to pay off debt, you have to reduce expenditure and increase tax also to increase the revenue base of the government. So in this way, the Democrats, when they are given chance, with the idea of increasing the revenue base of the government, will be able to do it. On the expenditure side, they want to reduce expenditure on the military, especially for offensive purposes. That will also work, because if you reduce military expenditure, then you, uh, you depend on defensive military, then the debt can be eliminated somewhere within 50 years time. So if Americans vote for the party that holds an effective solution to debt reduction for a long time, the economy would be in better shape. Yes, the, the economy would be in better shape. It would be in better shape because uh, uh, with the Democrats' approach of um, increasing the revenue side of the government, they will be able to come up with programs that will solve the problem. Like I've already said, if you vote for a group that had the solution over a long period of time, they will be able to solve the problem. And here, do we say the Democrats are going to solve the problem or the Republicans or the Tea Party? Um, when you look at the Tea Party, I, I think at this point, Tea Party is not a full-grown party. They don't have leaders. Like the Bull Run Party of 1812, uh, 1912, which has automatically a leader. But they are a parasitic party at this moment. So when they become a full-grown party, they will also be able, they will be helpful. However, the Democrat side, as you said, if we give them a long period of time, if they have the solution, the Americans can vote for them to solve the problem. If the Republicans have the solution, we can also vote for them. Whoever has the solution, and Americans identify that group, they will vote for that particular group to solve the problem. My name is Nanaya Drakeford. I am a college student and a young voter. My question to you, Dr. Costa, is, what are the economic theories, principles, or ideas behind the fiscal policies of the Republicans, the Democrats, with specific reference to President Obama? On the Republican side, the principles behind is what we call the classical economic approach. The classical economic approach is also known as the supply side economics. Supply-side economics in modern time is also known as Reaganomics. Supply-side economics believe that social programs are wasteful. Therefore, we shouldn't involve ourselves in safety, social safety nets, right? And then also, 
they believe that you have to allow all businesses to compete. By competition, they will be able to move the economy up. So by competition, they believe in the business sector. The businessmen and the business women are considered as engineers, economic engineers, right? Who, who can really help the economy to grow. So if you want to help anyone to improve the economy, you have to look at the supply side of the economy. The supply side indicates that set up good business environment because it's the business people who employ people, right? They set up the investment, set up businesses, and improve the economy. So why don't you have them? On the macro side, they have picked tax cuts. If you cut tax for the business people, they will be able to improve the economy. And so that is what is behind the Republicans' approach, that the business side is the one to be considered to move the economy. On the Democrat side, they also believe in Keynesian economics. Keynesian economics is the demand side economics. The demand side economics is to see that the household the worker, the poor folks, should be given enough money to empty the stores so that producers will produce and fill the stores. So they believe that demand determines its own supply. But the other side, the Republicans believe supply determines its own demand. So this is the two dialectical principles working in America. Now, talking with specific reference to Barack Obama, Barack Obama's economy, we can call it coercive numbers. It's a, there is a force in this kind of economy. Why? Because when he came, Bush tax cut was a law. So he has to accept it as it is. It was a law until 2010 that it has to be you know, considered, and that it has to be removed. So, on Obama's side, he has inherited that. And he, he inherited the economy where he has to push the demand side of the economy. So now he has two targets. The supply side is working with the Bush tax cut. And he also cut down 2% tax for the lower income level people. So with these two direct targets, we see that Obama's economy approach is different. He is not of demand side and he's not of the supply side. Both are working at this time. By the 19, in 2010, Bush tax cut has to go. Did it go? The Republicans won the Congress and they came out with a plan. Either you allow Bush tax cut to go or you have to let go unemployment insurance. It was very tricky. So Obama decided on unemployment insurance for the meantime and allowed the Bush tax cut to go on. And so this is what we call a dictated fiscal policy. We have the Bush tax cut and Obama's tax cut at the same time. So the demand side and the supply side working at the same time. So you can call it demand soft or coercive numbers. Then in 2012, during the election, Obama went forward with the idea that the Bush tax cut has to go. He won the election, but then there was a political deal. The deal was if you want to let the Bush tax cut to go, then you have to let it be around $450,000. Anyone receiving $450,000 has to continue with the Bush tax cut. So at this point, he wanted it to be $250,000, but it stayed at $450,000. So in this way, Obama's economic principles, right, 
is both the supply side and demand side at work. So I call it coercive numbers. Other than that, the main economic principles at work is the classical economics and Keynesian economics. Which is which? We are yet to see which one will be more effective. With Obama's one, I hope whoever will be the next president will be able to eliminate one part and stick to the other part. It's either demand side or supply side. Thank you, Dr. Nana. In your own observation, what are some concrete approaches to solve the national pro debt problem? According to my research, number one, with the progressive tax, everybody must pay the appropriate tax. The, the middle class war must end. Everybody has to pay appropriate tax so that more money will flow into the government coffers. Number two, military offensive expenditure must be cut so that money will also flow into the government coffers. We should not involve ourselves only with the idea of hegemony, the idea of being the only senior superpower in the world, solving every country's problem and installing puppet kings around the world. Other countries must also be involved in policing the world. In that way, America will be able to reduce much expenditure on military expeditions outside the country. And number three, Medicaid must pay for itself, which means they have to increase the cap so that Medicaid can pay for itself. Number four, there should be reasonable reduction in expenditure by cleaning the system, take away all corruptions away from the system, clean the system, and so that reasonable expenditure will be, will be realized. And number five, we have to bust up the demand side of the economy so that people will be able to buy goods so that business will go off. In that way, we can see that the economy can improve. So what I would say that the tax that everybody should pay should not be only rich people's problem. It should be everybody's problem. Uh, if we allow only the rich to pay, people receiving 450000 is not a small money. But sometimes we say that if we reduce tax, the economy will grow. So don't increase tax. That is OK. But if you increase tax, the economy will not go down in a way. Because if you increase tax accordingly, then the government will be able to have enough money to pay the debt or to do other things to improve the economy. This is the end of the first section of our discussion with Dr. Vinit Nana Asante Kankam de Costa. Based on his book, Who is Fit to Rule America in the 21st Century and Beyond? Thank you, <laughs> Professor Barbara Purify. Thank you, Nana. I'm William Nagy, Jr., and my question is, Dr. Nana, is this. You previously said that the American economic problem of high debt has been mainly caused by wars, recessions, and inflations. So which political party has caused more unemployment and inflation since the 1920s. 
when we're talking about unemployment, we're also talking about job creation. If you create job and increase employment, unemployment goes down. So we will take it from the Great Depression, as you said. On the Great Depression, in 1930, President Roosevelt had 25% unemployment rate. By 1944, he reduced unemployment to 1.2. By 1945, unemployment came down to 1.9%, which is far below the natural rate of unemployment. The natural rate of unemployment is considered to be 4%. So anybody that create job to bring unemployment down to 4%, which means the economy is in full employment level. The economy say 4% unemployment rate or 4% natural unemployment rate is full employment level. And so reducing unemployment to 1.2 to 1.9 is below unemployment rate natural rate of unemployment. So that was uh, a good job by President Roosevelt. President Truman, in 1945, took it from 3.75%. By the time he left office in 1952, unemployment rate was 3.03%, which was also below the natural rate of unemployment. Then President Kennedy and President Johnson, 1961, took it from 6.69%. By the time Johnson left office in 1968, the unemployment rate was 356 which is below 4% natural rate of unemployment. And so that was also good. Then President Carter, that was a critical time, he took it from 7.95 unemployment rate in 1977. By 1980, he reduced it to 5.84%. That's a little above natural rate of unemployment. Then President Clinton, 1993, took it from 6.10%. By the year 2000, he has reduced it to 3.97%, which was also below the natural rate of unemployment. President Barack Obama took it from 9.7% by 2014. It is estimated that the unemployment rate now is 6.10%. He hasn't completed his term yet, so we don't know how far it will go down. Looking at it from this way, Every Democrat from the Great Depression to now take unemployment from a very high level and brings it down, which means they are able to create jobs. Now let's look at the Republican side. President Eisenhower was the first president of the Republican Party after the Great Depression. And he took it 2.93% unemployment. By the time he left office in 1960, unemployment was 6.84, which was above the natural rate of unemployment. President Nixon and President Ford in 1968 took it from 3.49%. In 1976, it was 7.7% which was also above the natural rate of unemployment. President Reagan, in 1981, took it from 7.62. In 1984, he increased it to 10.8%. Then after that, before he left office in 1988, he brought it down to 6.0% which was also above the natural rate of unemployment. President H.W. Bush, that is the father Bush, 
He took it from 5.26%. By the time he left office in 1992, it was 7.49%, which was also above the natural rate of unemployment. President George W. Bush, which is the son Bush, he took it from 4.74%. By the time he left office in 2008, unemployment rate was 7%. So looking at it from numbers, this is not a political campaign for any political party, but we're looking at it from research base. So looking at it from a research base, all the Republican president after the Great Depression has a recession talk on them. Everybody, great recession. Looking at the numbers, it is not too good. The task card is a good policy, but it's not yielding the results. So sometimes probably they have to check what, what, what is causing the problem. And on the Democrat side, we can say they create job. Because when you look at it, Reagan is the only one who brought unemployment down. But even though his numbers isn't too good compared to Carter, in terms of unemployment. On the inflation side, that's where we will say Republicans have been doing a great job. Waldo Wilson took inflation in 1915 at 1 1.48, but during the First World War, inflation went up. It went up all the way to 20.44% which was very high. But after the war, inflation came down to 2.65, which was relatively stable. President Harden, President Coolidge, and President Hoover, they all maintained inflation at a negative number, which means inflation was so low in the 1920s. That was a great job. And President Roosevelt and Truman, during the war, inflation went up. Because before the war, inflation was very low. Very, very low. Around 2%, 3%. But during the war time, inflation went up to as much as 10%, 10.27%. And 11%. But after the war, inflation came down. So, in that way, it was these two major wars the First World War and the Second World War that saw inflation going up. Rest, President Arsenal, his time we say inflation was relatively stable, it stabilized inflation. So there was no problem during his time. President Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson also maintained relative low inflation between 1.07 and 4.27, which was also stable inflation. But here comes the problem. President Nixon's time, his reckless foreign policy in the Middle East made the oil cartel countries to shorten the supply of oil. And that created what we call the supply shock in America. In that way, oil price went up, which increased inflation. So during uh, Nixon's time, inflation went as high as 9.20%. And President Ford came with the idea of whipping inflation. He whipped inflation whipped inflation, and inflation was not whipped. So he left high inflation to President Carter. Carter's time was the worst time and as far as inflation was concerned. He wasn't able to bring the inflation down. The numbers was between 6.50 to 13.35%. That was the only time inflation was so bad which was inherited by Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan had to be praised for bringing inflation down. 
he saw that the inflation was not a monetary inflation, but a product inflation. He dealt leniently with the Arab countries and never put any troops in, on Arab land. And oil flow was in abundance all over in the world. So Reagan was able to bring inflation down to the time of Arsenal of 2%. That was a great credit to Ronald Reagan. President, his, his follower, his successor, President George H.W. Bush, also had a relative stable inflation. President, Carter, uh, President Clinton also had a relatively stable inflation. So inflation actually had not been a problem, with the exception of Nixon, Ford, and Carter. So in, on, on the part of inflation, all the parties have done a good job. It is only on the employment side or job creation then we will say that Democrats really create jobs if they can bring unemployment down. And so Republicans on the other side, even though they say they create jobs, but the numbers aren't so good to say that they have created great jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nana. Um, America is a capitalist economy where supply and, determine, uh, and demand are expected to determine the market rates or prices. Is there any need for government intervention and labor union intervention? Great. Right. In economics, the market should be left alone to be determined by supply and demand. And in that way, if it is a perfect competitive market, we say that the consumers have sovereignty to determine the price. It is only in perfect competitive market that consumers have sovereignty to determine price. But in American economy, all the businesses are trying to have market power. One. There is what we call monopolistic competition. Monopolistic competition allow individual companies to have power over price and over output if they can differentiate themselves. Also, in an economy where few big companies can come together and form a government, they control the market. In some regions, we also have monopoly. For example, GTE has monopoly power in, in supplying electricity within sub areas of Michigan. Also, when it comes to consumer energy, GTE can supply energy, consumer energy can supply energy, right? And so, only few companies. So, they control price. So, looking at it with imperfect market. We need the government to set to set up a consumer watchdog. Because other than that, the consumer have no say in the economy where everybody is trying to be imperfect. Imperfect market gives producers advantage over consumers. On the part of labor unions, let us look at this scenario. For instance, an owner of some capital set up business and hired 1,000 workers and 100 office workers. Each of the 1,000 workers produce a value of $1,500 a day. The owner of the capital pays each worker $80 a day. And the office workers, the lower office workers receive $120 a day. And the Higher paid uh, office workers receive $150 a day. So when you do the calculation, you can see that the total revenue per day by 1,000 workers is, is $1.5 million. And then the total cost, when we take depreciation, when you talk, we take uh, the variable cost, 
and all the costs combined will be about 400,000. When you take it out of the 1,500, the capitalist or the owner of production receive $1.1 million a day. So assuming they work for 300 days in a year, the owner of production looking at the table is going to receive $330 million. Each worker received $24,000. Each office worker received $36,000. Then the high office workers receive $45,000 a year, right? So in this way, who makes who rich and who made whom poor? So at the negotiating table, if you are an individual, you don't know your value, you don't know how much you value. Therefore, you need the labor union to be there. Even though labor unions can be nuisance to employers, but it is there for the betterment of the society because they will be able to balance the interest of the business people and the interest of the supplier of labor. So there's a need for labor union to be there for the interest of labor. And also there's a need of the government to be a referee between consumers and producers. Dr. Sante Felix Seldom. The 2014 minimum wage must be increased, but is recession not a major problem? If Iraq war comes to an end, and Afghanistan war also end, and there's no major war around the world, the economy will come back. So recession is not going to be a problem. Um, from your question, looking at it, um, that recession will be a problem. No, a recession is not going to be a major problem in the 21st century and beyond. Because when all wars are ended, the economy will bounce back. Dr. Vinny, yes. do you think abolishing the National Bank and IRS is a good thing for the United States? Because some Republicans are in agreement with this idea. These are some of the elementary ideas, especially to the uninformed minds of America, Americans. If you eliminate IRS, then there is no government. Because IRS is the bedrock of the government financially. So without the IRS, how will the government operate? Then also with the idea of federal bank. Without a national bank, you are taking us back to the time of Andrew Jackson, when the national bank was eliminated in the American system until 1913, when the Federal Reserve Bank was established. So the Federal Reserve Bank does a good job. Take for instance, with this present debt, if we allow interest rate to go up, the debt will increase so high. So the Federal Reserve Bank is accommodating the, the government fiscal policy by putting interest rate so low. So the Federal Bank plays a major role in the economy. So to eliminate federal bank is going to be a major problem. And we will go back to the time of Andrew Jackson. And to eliminate IRS is also a major problem. What they have to think about is how to improve it, but not to destroy it, because they are unique to American system. Hi, my name is Austin. I only want to ask to be here. Uh, Dr. Nana Asante, you have given vividly the main economic issues that the political parties in America today have to focus on. Have you ever informed some of the politicians in Washington about some of these critical issues? Other than just writing a book. Oh, yes. 
I've been written, I've written a lot of letters to our senators of Michigan, David Stabenow and Kyle Levin before 2010. I wrote to them concerning the economy. I also wrote to President Barack Obama concerning the economy. And all of them responded positively that they will follow the plan that I have informed them, especially Kyle Levin. He wrote that he will make sure that there will be physical responsibility in Washington. David Stabenow also wrote that she is supporting every policy that will ensure economic progress in the country. She will make sure that our debt will be reduced. And President Barack Obama also wrote that they are on the path of making sure that all the problems that I have informed them will be taken into consideration. President Barack Obama also thanked me and said I should continue to write to him concerning what I have been observing in the country over in America as a whole. And so with that gave me the impetus to write the book, which is today called Who is Fit to Rule America in the 21st Century and Beyond. Dr. Benick, you've done a wonderful job in discussing the economic issues relative to the United States in terms of who is really going to be fit to uh, rule our country in the 21st century and beyond. I think you deserve a round of applause for it. This can't be the end. We're really going to need you to discuss more, particularly about education and political issues the next time we meet. And I will be here. Thank you. I would definitely come. I will surely respond to your call. Thank you, everybody.